All right, everybody, continuing Chapter 11, this time taking a look at some of the programming policies that the FCC puts out. First one we'll start off with is children's television programming. The Act requires broadcasters to provide at least three hours of core programming a week for children ages 12 and under. Uh, now, this rule has changed uh, in the recent couple of years. In September of 2019, the FCC changed this requirement. Uh, the language no longer says three hours a week. It now says 156 hours a year. Now, that still averages the three hours a week. But the way that a station can implement this timing is a little more flexible. Uh, the FCC now requires that children's programming air for two hours a week. Uh, and then there's an additional 52 hours of content that needs to be aired at some point throughout the year. This is to allow stations to incorporate uh, special programming that may run uh, at times outside of the normal children's television block. Uh, and to rearrange certain schedules and things like that. Uh, so the amount of time is still the same, 156 hours a year, which averages the three hours a week, but the way that that time is, is aired throughout the year, there's a little more flexibility that the stations have. The FCC defines core programming. What, what is it? Uh, core programming is any regularly scheduled weekly program that lasts at least 30 minutes and airs between the hours of 7 a.m. and 10 p.m. The program has to serve the educational and informational needs of children as a significant purpose. So it is programming that is geared towards children to help to feed their brains, as it were. The act also imposes limitations on the amount of commercial time in children's programming. The programming can have a maximum of 10 and a half minutes per hour on weekends and 12 minutes an hour on weekdays. So if we're talking about 30 minute programs, you're basically looking at five to five and a quarter minutes of commercial programming, uh, commercial content rather per half hour on weekends, six minutes per half hour on weekdays. The television rating system, something else that we need to take a look at. We referenced that a little bit earlier in conjunction with the V-chip. Networks were asked to voluntarily label their programs with codes for sex, violence, and strong language or dialogue. And you see the listings there on your screen. This is a, a table I believe it's table 11-2 that comes from your textbook, so you can reference it in there. News and sports programs, they are not rated, but everything else is. The ratings, uh, there's not necessarily a standard uh, that uh, a standard agency that determines what show gets what rating. Those ratings are determined either by the program producer or by the broadcaster itself. So it is uh, on the responsibility of uh, one of them to uh, put the label on as to uh, what the content of that program contains and whether it's appropriate for children or not. Obscenity. Well, we need to define this word. What is obscene? The Supreme Court has determined that the average person applying contemporary community standards might find that the work as a whole appeals to Prurient interests, and the word prurient is basically a fancy word that means that it's content that has or encourages an excessive interest in sexual matters. That is one criteria of what the FCC will consider obscene. Secondly, the work depicts or describes in an offensive way sexual conduct specifically defined by the applicable state law. Thirdly, that the work lacks some serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. This is uh, what's called the LAPS test, L-A-P-S. Uh, this is why when uh, you watch certain programs on TV, they're allowed to show nudity or allow for certain expletives to be able to broadcast because it meets the standard 
of something of literary or artistic or political or scientific value. Um, which is why uh, several years ago when NBC aired the movie Schindler's List, it was allowed to show uh, the scenes of, uh, of the, uh, the people going into some of the concentration camps nude uh, because it was significant to the telling of that particular story. Indecency, the definition of indecent language. Again, this is language or material that depicts or describes in terms patently offensive as measured by contemporary community standards for the broadcast medium, sexual or excretory activities of organs. Uh, the U.S. Court of Appeals ruled that the commission could permit broadcasting of indecent material between the hours of 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. today, known as the safe harbor, and they call it such because uh, they consider those overnight hours, hours where expectedly children would be sleeping and therefore not uh, necessarily be subjected to uh, some of these materials. So uh, the, the FCC determined that, uh, yes, you can air these things as a freedom of speech issue, but at the same time, in an effort to uh, protect children from certain types of content, they restrict that content to those late night hours. Equal time provisions. Section 312 of the 1934 Communications Act requires broadcasters to give reasonable access to qualified federal candidates. Then Section 315 requires stations to provide equal opportunity for all legally qualified candidates for public office. So there's a couple of things there. If it's a, uh, a qualified federal candidate, stations are required to give candidates access to the airways. Section 315, if it's not a federal candidate, it just requires stations provide equal opportunity. So a station could choose to provide no opportunity to anybody uh, that is not a federal candidate. Uh, but uh, if it provides time to one, it needs to provide time to others in an equal fashion. Uh, mostly these days, we're talking about political advertising when it comes to this equal opportunity uh, provision. The, the thing that uh, is enforced in particular when it comes to political advertising is that stations must sell political advertising at the lowest unit rate charge to qualified candidates. And the way that is determined is by looking at sales records for clients from the past several months prior to an election. And whatever the lowest rate that a uh, advertising client paid the station, that's the rate that they must offer to a political candidate. Broadcasting a hoax. The new rules forbid broadcasting of false information if three criteria apply. First, that the sender knows the information is false. Second, the broadcaster of the hoax may cause public harm. And third, that broadcasting the information does in fact cause harm. So it's kind of the uh, broadcaster's equivalent of inciting a riot um, or uh, giving false testimony, if you will. Uh, those are things that the FCC will not look too kindly upon. Lotteries. Broadcasters may not broadcast or sponsor a commercial lottery. Um, and there's basically this definition of what a lottery is in the eyes of the FCC. A lottery would require an individual to pay a fee or purchase of a product or service before participating. So this is a uh, fancy definition for what they call consideration. Uh, when someone provides uh, something in order to be considered to win a prize. Secondly, a lottery provides an opportunity to be selected. So it's a game of chance. And then thirdly, uh, that there is some sort of award of value that is offered 
as a result of the end of the competition, which is the prize. So consideration, chance, and prize, all three of those things, uh, if they are present, that is considered to be a lottery, and that is considered to be illegal. Unless, of course, uh, we're talking about a state-run lottery, uh, like the North Carolina Education Lottery, for example. Uh, those things are allowed to be broadcast. As far as contests, where we're not talking about someone paying something to enter, those things are still going to be regulated as well. Electronic media companies must be very careful when engaging in contests that could create liability issues. Contests need to be vetted very carefully by management and for extra assurance by the facility's legal counsel as necessary. Uh, one of the best things a station can do when it comes to running a contest is make sure that the contest rules are very clear and are very prominently available. Most TV and radio stations will post their contest rules on their website, and those rules need to be followed very particularly in order for contests to be fair and contests to be legal. The FCC and cable television. Cable operators do not obtain a license from the FCC, but instead they're awarded a franchise from a local government authority such as a city council or county commissioners. The franchise agreement sets forth the requirements for each local system regarding the fees, the channels, uh, the taxes levied, and so on and so on. The 1992 Cable Act was designed to re-regulate the cable industry in several specific areas, including rates for basic cable service. When we're talking about basic cable service here, most of the time we are talking about a cable company providing access to the local broadcast channels in that market uh, in order to make broadcast television accessible to people that um, may not be able to pick up their local TV through a broadcast antenna. And because of the information value that the government deems uh, is worthy when it comes to local news on local broadcast stations, uh, the government has seen fit that uh, cable companies would provide that service at, uh, at a low affordable rate so that people can have access to that rather easily. From the 1996 Telecommunications Act, rate deregulation for basic cable occurred. As a result, national rate regulation for basic cable was eliminated, uh, eliminated in 1999. In many cases, the cable operator and the franchising authority negotiate rate increases. So instead of there being uh, a laid down uh, minimum from the government, uh, there is negotiation with the government in terms of what that basic rate is going to be and uh, what is going to be included within that. Must carry and retransmission consent. Uh, these are kind of two sides of a particular issue. Uh, the provision here for must carry and retransmission, this basically gives broadcasters the right to negotiate with the cable operator for carriage of their station. But TV stations now have one of two options to be able to levy. They can either take what is known as must carry, which requires the cable operator to carry the television signal on the cable system at the channel's regularly or mutually agreed on channel position. So in other words, if channel 17 in Raleigh uh, went to Spectrum and said, we want to use the must carry option, then uh, Spectrum would be required to carry channel 17 on channel 17 of the cable service. Uh, or if they uh, agreed on a different channel allocation, uh, then they could do that. S the alternative is that broadcasters can opt for retransmission consent in lieu of must carry, and then they would negotiate individually with each cable system for compensation and channel position. So this becomes uh, more of an opportunity for local broadcast stations to earn revenue uh, from the cable companies for the right to carry their programming. 
Um, and uh, that also does away with, uh, with some of the requirements that, uh, that are levied against cable to, uh, to carry a channel because uh, of the, uh, the stance of the broadcaster. Congress and the FCC have not required MVPDs to include digital subchannels as part of the must-carry provisions. We talked about that a little bit earlier. The must-carry rules uh, only apply to the primary signal of a broadcast outlet. Ownership provisions. Currently, there is no cap requirement for cable television ownership by MVPDs. They can own as many franchises as they want in as many areas as they want. Network exclusivity. Cable operators may neither carry nor import network-affiliated programming that duplicates the same program on a local TV station. Most of the time, the way that this works would be that, uh, say, if uh, Channel 17 in Raleigh, the CBS affiliate for Raleigh, uh, is airing network programming during prime time, uh, then it has the right to go to the cable company and say, since we're the ones that carry CBS programming in Raleigh, uh, if you decide to also carry Channel 2 out of Greensboro, then you have to block uh, the CBS programming that airs on Channel 2 uh, from broadcasting in our market. Similarly, with syndication exclusivity or Syndex, uh, it's the idea that when a television station buys syndicated programming... Oh, Generally, they pay a good bit of money for that uh, privilege, and they want assurance that their programs are not going to be duplicated elsewhere. So if a station signs an exclusive market agreement with a syndicator uh, for carriage of that program, they can once again go to the cable operator and say, we're the ones that have the right to air Judge Judy, if we're talking about Channel 17, for example. Uh, so Channel 17 could say, any other station that you carry that airs Judge Judy, we want you to black that out so that they can only watch Judge Judy on Channel 17. Program access channels. The 1984 Cable Act established the right of franchising bodies to require that certain channels be designated for public educational or government access. Sometimes these are called PEG channels for short PEG, Public Educational Governmental, uh, and many times these are the community access stations, uh, public access, uh, access stations uh, that are available uh, for local, local programming to be able to be provided. Uh, and this is still a thing today, uh, although there are some transitions that are going on where a lot of local content providers are making their programs available online. Sometimes even cable systems are making those programs available online through the cable services platform. So we have one more section to hit in this chapter. Part D of chapter 11 is coming up next.